Welcome back to another AP Psychology course video. This is lesson number six on the ethics of psychological research. And what this video is going to be about is basically looking at both uh, animal research and human research and some of the conditions that have been set forth to guide psychologists in deciding are they making the right choices for this experiment or not? Are they uh, following the conditions set forth by the APA or the uh, IRB, which will be the review board for a particular university. And um, in looking at these issues, you know, with animal research in particular, there's a lot of people that feel very strongly that uh, we shouldn't research on animals. Um, there are a lot of things to consider, like the percentage of animal research as a whole in terms of psychological research, uh, the amount of animals every year that are consumed for food purposes or animals that are killed in uh, shelters. So uh, there are many points to the arguments and while we're not really going to argue here because this is just me, um, in class you know we'll be able to have some good discussion about these topics. But for now let's go ahead and look at the uh, animal research guidelines and what kind of expectations are set forth by the APA or the IRB. So first, animals need to have a clear scientific purpose and the research needs to answer an important scientific question. What this means is that when you're researching on animals, a question that's going to be addressed or uh, the purpose of your experiment, it needs to be very obvious. If you're just looking like you're torturing animals for the sake of maybe learning something, then that's not really showing a clear scientific purpose. Likewise, if you are answering a question that has already been answered or is not really going to further that subject matter, you're probably not really contributing anything of value, so that's something that should not be approved. Uh, use the best suited animals for the experiment. So, you know, if you can use a rat, then there's no reason that a, a monkey or a dog or a horse or some larger mammal should be used. Um, a lot of the research in psychology is conducted on rats and mice, but it doesn't mean that there isn't anything that uh, could conduct research on uh, you know, horses or dogs. There certainly are cases for that, and there are certainly times where maybe that is the better suited animal, but ultimately you know, just following that principle is important. Uh, the animals need to be cared for humanely. Usually what this means is that they need to be uh, post-research, if they are going to survive, they need to be cared for humanely in a sense that they are entitled to a decent living, having some social exposure with other animals. Um, in the process of the experiment, if the animal is to endure pain, then also like number six there, employ the least amount of suffering feasible. So if there's a situation where an animal is definitely going to be exposed to pain, and maybe they are anesthetized so that they are uh, kind of unconscious. Um, and then also the animals have to be acquired illegally. So buying animals on the black market to basically conduct psychological research on would basically be a no-no. And so this would be something primarily in places where people are trying to get access to maybe more exotic animals, which uh, unfortunately it you know is likely that somebody is conducting experience, experiments on those even if it's unsanctioned. Um, that's you know, some of that. It's important to look at uh, some data about the opposition to this. So you have basically uh, the group PETA, which basically tries to protect animals and uh, wildlife. And so this was an organization started uh, started in 1974, and they had about 8,000 members. But um, as recently as 2003, it has really, really grown uh, on a massive scale. So they have over 750,000 members today. So uh, that's an important thing to consider, and these are many people who are giving some uh, voice to the argument against testing on animals. But only about 7-8% of psychological studies actually involve animals, and out of those, um, only about 1% of uh, animals worldwide, if even that much, probably it is even less than 1%, would be actually used for psychological testing. And so that's a pretty small percentage when you consider the amount of animals that are bred for consumption or the amount of animals that are killed annually by uh, humane societies because they can't find homes for them or animals that are um, 
you know, uh, neglected in the homes and die as a result of that, or they go lost. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that can be asked. You know, certainly the biggest one is probably like this uh, billboard at the bottom here. I'm actually noticing that may not be able to be viewed completely. So let me just move this over here to the side. And um, who would you rather see live, the little girl or the mouse, the rat? And so there are very big things that have came as a result of animal testing, for example, like the uh, animals had to die for that to be established, but you know, weighing the the grand scale of things, millions of lives are saved, and not just human lives, also animal lives as well. And so, uh, there are people who are suffering from different handicaps, disabilities, mental illnesses. There may not be any hope for those people to find something uh, that could help them if it were not for testing on animals. And so, that's kind of one of the bigger arguments uh, posed to the critics. And so it's very easy from a, a healthy standpoint to decide, you know, I'm against animal testing because, you know, I think hurting animals is wrong. And in society, we can place a, a hierarchy of, you know, we have companion pets at the top like dogs and cats. Well, that's, that's definitely not okay to research on them. But, you know, a mouse or a snake or a guinea pig or a pig or something like that, people maybe have a little bit of a looser sense of, well, I could understand it maybe. But when it comes down to it, um, if you are suffering from a disability and, and there really isn't any hope at the moment without uh, further research on animals, then certainly you're going to be the type of person who says, you know, I'm all for animal testing because maybe I don't want to be suffering from this for my whole life. Or if there are gains that can be found to understand how we can even improve the lives of animals as a result of animal testing, which uh, has been found in dealing with animals in uh, adoption shelters and how to basically ease their transition into adoptive homes. I mean, that's stuff that's been found. So it's a big topic. Uh, in terms of human research, basically you can't force people into experiencing uh, the experiment. It has to be voluntary with an uh, ability to leave at any time. Uh, you must have their informed consent, so they have to know what they're getting into. In terms of protecting their privacy, uh, they need to be having a sense of anonymity or the uh, results need to be kept confidential. Um, risk in the experiment needs to be at a minimum and so if there is any harm for example then it needs to be uh, uh, minimal uh, and this includes both psychological harm and physical harm. Usually physical harm would be really unlikely depending on what it is. I mean uh, there are obviously going to be exceptions for things but the psychological harm is a bit more of a uh, uh, evident uh, case. There are some famous controversial experiments where there is some psychological harm left. And so we'll be looking at those in the social psychology unit. But there are also cases of physical harm as well where people had both uh, physical scars and emotional scars. So you know, the idea that you're going to conduct an experiment that may cause harm is pretty important. So. Uh, it would be preferred that there is a minimal amount of risk in terms of danger. Um, but deception sometimes is required for the experiments to get a true gauge of uh, the results. And so if you have to deceive someone, uh, while that is allowed, they need to be debriefed. So debriefing just means when the experiment is over, uh, they're made aware of the deception or they're made aware of the results of the experiment. Uh, what exactly was taking place. And this can be done in a number of ways. Um, it depends on exactly how your experiment is going, but um, it can, a phone call could suffice, a letter in the mail. Um, one thing that would be important would be to continue to protect the confidentiality of other participants. So it would be unwise to debrief someone and give them results of every single person involved in the experiment, including their names and social security numbers and date of birth and things like that. That would be very bad. So uh, you certainly wouldn't want to debrief in that way. And it seems that the uh, college board likes to ask a lot of questions uh, on the AP exams, particularly on some of the writing sections. If you look at uh, some of the prompts over the years, they really like asking about uh, ethics. It is a big component to the research. And so this is definitely an area to uh, study wisely. Um, here's some more stuff about deception, basically the arguments of uh, why deception is important and then 
obviously uh, the critic view. So uh, I'm, I'm not really going to go into this too much. It's, it's kind of really here and can be read easily. But uh, I've already kind of pointed some of this out anyways. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is uh, pretty much all six main guidelines set forth by the APA. So the other ones were kind of some conditions. These are the actual uh, guidelines that they've set forth. And so uh, I'm not going to read over all of these. Uh, all of them have been covered in this video so far. And so uh, I'll just hit on number six, which is that when you are concluding an experiment and reporting the results, it's very important to post honest and accurate reports and honest and accurate results and not omit any data uh, because if it is a significant experiment your uh, psychology colleagues and peers in the community they're going to want to look at the results and they're going to want to try to replicate this experiment and so if you are leaving out crucial parts of the data or you are being misleading and not sharing everything completely uh, this is going to raise some flags and so this would look bad and uh, would tarnish your reputation as a psychologist so you certainly wouldn't want that and uh, that pretty much is going to conclude this video um, I'll leave you with this picture that I found on Google Images and it looks at which animal is used most for lab testing in each state and so this is the type of thing that gets put out there and people see it and they're like oh my gosh this is so bad you know uh, look at these states that are conducting on pigs and sheep and dogs and you know it's just not rats but it's important to see the small print, which if you saw this really quickly, you may not even notice it, but it says that basically the data includes uh, uh, animals in USDA registered facilities in 2013, but it excludes specifically mice, rats, and non-mammals. And so mice and rats, I'm certain, are the most often uh, animals tested on during uh, lab tests in every single one of these states. But... It takes a back seat here. They leave this out. So you see uh, Arizona or Nevada, wow, they're doing a lot of testing on dogs. And your mind is not thinking about this data that has excluded the mice and the rats. So uh, anyways, that pretty much concludes the video. So hopefully you learned something. Feel free to go back through the video if you think that uh, anything was covered too quickly or you missed anything. And I uh, hope to see you next time. All right.